Because, you know, people ask me about you. You're notorious on many levels, you know. People, what's he really, really, what's he really like? You, you, you've excited or stimulated this conversation all over the place. And I have to say, whatever else you may be, and you're probably mad as a hatter, when they take your brain apart, they're going to find out that you were singularly nuts. You are a genuine guy. And what's more to the point is you, that you're an original. You're a true original. Shatner's like Mr. Television. Phil Shatner, I mean, you can't turn on the TV without seeing him in something. It's amazing how he's morphed into so many different people. The twinkle in his eye has just gotten brighter and brighter and brighter. He's still got the thing that I found so sexy, which is a fire in his belly that he's not afraid to light and show. I'm William Shatner, and this is The Captain's Close-Up with William Shatner. How did that happen? Do you make your own luck? Have you, Bill Shatner, made your own luck? Because I don't know any other person as driven as you. You know, I don't think of myself as being driven. You don't? No. I think of myself as saying, hey, I'm given this opportunity. I think I should take it and grasp the opportunity because tomorrow I may not have that opportunity. I am still the actor who was saying, I wonder when the next job has come. I've got three kids. How am I going to feed them? How am I going to get above $1,800 on my bank? That tape still plays in your mind? Absolutely. Does it really? Oh, my God. You don't stop. You're indefatigable and ubiquitous. <laughs> <laughs> My luck's been pretty good over the last several years. In fact, on a scale of one to 10, I'd say it was 110. I, I've never been busier, and that's good, because idle is not in my vocabulary. I, I've done that television series, recorded albums, toured all over the world with my one-man show, died in Pin Reborn, been in pole vaulting competitions, and done a lot of documentaries. Well, technically, I haven't had a pole in my hands in quite a while. But I am on my ninth documentary, and it just so happens it's on, wouldn't you know it, me. Yeah, I know, it's a little weird making a show about yourself, but hey, I'm contractually obligated. In 2011, I produced and directed The Captains, a documentary about all the captains of Star Trek. I traveled over 25,000 miles, gained a lot of insight and some weight, but what I also found out were some things about myself. As it turns out, Kate Mulgrew was the one that brought them to light. I'm always curious as to what your deepest need is, either vis-a-vis -vis your deepest insecurity or vis-a-vis -vis who you really are. Is your deepest need to perform, to work, or is your deepest need to love? I realize at my late age that the most important thing in life is love. But I also recognize this, that in order to love, even if you have the object of your love beside you, you need to be healthy. You need the energy, the excess energy from staying well. Anything above that, you can devote to somebody else. But if you're not well, you can't love because you're so consumed with survival. You think that's true? Bill? I absolutely think that's true. That survival precedes love. Right. And survival takes many forms, like work. So if you're surviving by work and surviving in your health, you have the, ex the sexual energy or the erotic energy to lavish on other things, which means your love object, pets, house, art, this is Picasso. One feeds the other. Did Picasso say that? I agree with that. Then I'll buy a Picasso. But I've, I've noted this in men, I, again, I would say, I, I'm, I'm saying of your stripe, of your ego size and strength. Your ego strikes me as being singularly uh, um, <laughs> intact, very, very, very uh, why, healthy. Why would you say that? And right next to that is your libido, which is also very healthy. And the, what you get from your work just sort of goes right in. It's like a little box feeding. But other. of course, mm -hmm. absolutely. So that as age comes upon you 
Yeah. And the hormonal drives are lessened and then finally extinguished. Oh, and as the so. fire of life begins to be banked, your, your erotic energy begins to disappear. And the fire that you bring to things you do goes away. And that hasn't happened to me yet. I knew there was going to be a, <laughs> there was going to be a punchline to that. That hasn't happened to you yet? What is there left to do after 70 years in the business? Well, talk about it, of course, on Broadway. Show us the way, Paul. This is it. Scott Ferris, director, Shatner, one of the producers, Larry Thompson. Into the night I rode. I was part of the city, part of the night, part of the road. The cycle you're working on is the cycle called yourself. And that's where you were. And that's what I did. Night after night Great. after night. And yeah. then get right to the question. Okay, so I now. need that yeah, that's economy. That's very tight and very That good. economy. Stratford, Ontario, a classical company. We dug a hole in the ground and we put a tent over it. Tonight's show, the, uh, Freddie DeCordova says, too long. Yeah, th too long, three <clears> minutes. I do three minutes. Well, who's he and this guy? Oh, dad, look over. And there's Johnny Carson saying, <laughs> End of Transform Man. Yeah, and you want me to go on? He goes, Well, <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do it. Don't let it yeah. get away. <laughs> I think that's really good, Scott. So cut so out Charlie. So I got Charlie. the job, Mr. Shatner? Do I get to stay? <laughs> you get the job. <laughs> Excellent, everybody. Rock Good and morning. roll. Rock and roll. Sixty years since I was first in New York on Broadway. Still trying to get some insight into Susie Wong. Actually, the late 50s and early 60s were a very good time for me. I had a lot of opportunities, and I took advantage of most of them, including one that came in the form of a telephone call. I was in New York, and I got a call from a guy named Roddenberry, <laughs> who said, my name is Roddenberry, and uh, we've shot a pilot. And it didn't sell, but what they said was, recast it, and we'll take another look. Bill had a series on television that was, I believe, shot in New York, and it ended, and uh, he became available as Jeffrey Hunter was exiting, and they snatched him up, and uh, that locked the deal. They had a show. Phasers, fire, point blank. So I met Leonard and Bill in the first reading around the table with all of us sitting there. It was something else. I remember the first day we saw the dailies of the first, first shot we did. I thought, wow, this show is going to be great. At the time, Bill was on his way, basically, to becoming a movie star, I thought. I mean, he appeared in really fine films. He had a similar buildup of a career as Robert Redford in that he did all the prestigious television shows, whether it was Twilight Zone or he was in Judgment at Nuremberg in a major part, as I recall. And then this new, gigantic role of Captain Kirk, a total original. He had to do all of the creation on it. There was no precedent, and uh, how do you do this thing? And, and, and how, what's the manner in which you say this, these words? And, and therefore, the classical work that all of us have done yeah. came to use. Because he was theatrical, and I think that was his, I think that was his strength. <laughs> Risk is our business. That's what the Starship is all about. That's why we're aboard her. Over half a century in show business is really a long time. Shouldn't I have gotten a watch from somebody by now? Well, I did finally win an Emmy. Actually, more than one. Took him long enough. It's been an adventure, that's for sure with plenty of twists and turns, and something everyone finds out sooner or later in this business, success always comes with a price. I know that you have loved, and I know that you have loved uh, deeply. But vis-a-vis -vis your career, has it been difficult to love completely? And has love suffered because of your career needs and or choices? I got married at a very early age. My career hadn't even really started. I was a young actor in Canada. I got married and had children almost right away. Within a year, I had a baby. I was distraught over how am I going to survive 
as an actor and then keep a roof over my head, our head, and pay for all the things babies need. And this was in New York in live television days. And so I, I worked and I worked and I worked. I worked very hard. Had another baby, had another baby. And the bills mounted up. There was the need in my being for love, passion, lust. I hadn't had much of that as a young man. When I got to be an actor and people knew me, I had more opportunities for the kind of girls that I would love to have had when I was single. So for a long time, I reached out for uh, love of all different kinds, nurturing, uh, passion, all those kinds of things. Never found it in one woman. And But if I may uh, interrupt please? you for one second, are you suggesting that suddenly, due to your success, there, were, uh, there was a plethora of beautiful women available to you Correct. that theretofore had not been available That's to you. That's exactly right. And perhaps, or I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, is it true or is it not true? Because if I were a man, I think that I would find my, you're a kid in a candy store then. That's right. These women would not have been accessible to you had you been a failure as an actor. Mm. One thinks not. <laughs> right, right. So is the ego just lambasted Absolutely. and you're sort of dazzled, right? Yeah. There I was, a lonely kid in Montreal, uh, trying to survive as a kid, and suddenly, uh, some years later, I'm, I'm in the public eye, and women are, are available to me, and I'd never had that before, and so I succumbed to all that temptation. The amount of time that those series, and I did several, took, destroyed each marriage for the lack of time and attention to the marriage and also to the temptations that were around. The concept of being with one woman and being uniquely theirs arrived with my wife, Noreen. I began to understand how love can be heightened and sharpened and in a sense, blissful being with one lady and devoting all your attention, physical, spiritual, emotional, to that one lady. Noreen died. I was left with these almost 10 years of, I had a beautiful thing happen to me. Now it's gone. And then my luck, this thing that I have in life, yeah. I met my wife Elizabeth. Yes. <clears throat> and I've been completely true to her during the decade we've been married. Completely. But you have been a very hard working personality and actor in this last decade, have you not? Absolutely. Would Elizabeth tell me that, that she feels that she gets enough of you? No. We don't get enough of each other. We have so many things we do together that we get, don't get to do them as much as we'd like, but we get to do quite a bit. It is within the realm of possibility to work hard completely and utterly and do the same thing with love. Yes, but you know, who said it? One's work is an exacting mistress. And that was well answered to your question about love and work. Next question. Vacations are always a good idea. Guys. No save yourself. Some money. Surfing is my life now. Shatner has become so able, and he seems to enjoy <laughs> comedy and what he's done between Boston Legal and, and his activities with Priceline. He has brought this level of both sexuality and humor to his life and his work. Look, I'm here to help. He just played the roles that he seemed to be right for for the longest time before people realized he could stretch and do other things. He's an actor. The last series I did was uh, Boston Legal, which, uh, of course, Bill had a small part in that one, too. 
James Spader, who is, well, he's certainly one of the finest actors working today. He has a very particular way of working, very, um, very precise. As opposed to Bill, who has been doing it for so long, he knows it's just film, and he knows that his life does not depend on that particular scene. The difference of the way they worked would, you know, at, at first blush, you would think, oh, oh, this could, you know, 20 shows down the line, this could get uh, difficult. And it, I was always fascinated to what they worked so differently, and yet with such respect for each other's way of working. It was like the odd couple. It just was, you know, that kind of chemical thing that rarely happens, and when it happens, it's like catching lightning in a bottle. Does she understand that she's sideways? I'm fine, honey. Liz, the what? image is sideways. No, it's not. It's good. No, it's not. It may appear to be <laughs> on this frame. Well, then Just it'll be artistic. Don't let her write <laughs> sideways. Now you're upside down. Why are you doing that? I'm not upside down. Well, then you were upside down before because you've now... Honey, I'm fine. Do you Don't understand what she's it. doing? She's, she's literally screwing up the whole thing. I'm doing this for nothing. Why are you letting her handle that? Because she's in the front seat. Well, I'll turn sideways. No. Liz had it upside down, I'll that's sideways. From my As, side. uh, nobody wants to watch that. That's crazy. I'm not talking. As long as she has the camera, I'm not talking. But they can stop now. I'm not talking. You don't see me talking? I'm not talking. This is me not talking. I am not talking. So you got enough material to work with. Well, I, I don't today, but I, I got about 20 minutes worth. We're good. But we're just But it, it just gets you, I wanted to see if I'm heading down the right road. Hell, I mean? don't know, Bill. Well, we're going to make it together, okay. so if you get the good vibe, I, I'm in. I've never let the fact that I can't sing keep me from making music. I'm now on my fourth, or is it my fifth album, this time with former Yes guitarist, singer-songwriter, and producer, Billy Sherwood. This needs from the very beginning is the knife edge of a guitar, a, a sure. electric guitar, shaping everything. <laughs> needs to be saved and act a tiny weeny bit brave. I'm always a little bit afraid, but I haven't said that to you because I'm a little bit afraid to. <laughs> like that's we might come out cold like that. I like that. Yeah. I wrote this. I filled this blank piece of paper up. You know, I don't have to tell you. It is a miracle to have words that go somewhere and to see it. So you're digging. I'm, oh. I'm not only I'm digging, I'm quelling. Okay, nice. <laughs> quelling. Paramount Studios, one of the first studios in the movie making business, 1910, 1920. First movies were made here. Star Trek that I did, Next Generation, all the Star Treks were shot here. Captain James C. Kirk of the USS Enterprise. I first got to know Chris during the filming of The Captains. Liked him a lot. This time I wanted to find out a little more about the new Captain Kirk and see what similarities there might be between where I was so many years ago and where Chris is today. Were you aware uh, that with the role comes a certain leadership of the whole company and so they're looking oh, at Oh man, I was so scared shit that I didn't even think about that. Well, it's an interesting thing. I, 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 what I really found with the group that I was involved with is that wonderfully we were, we were all in a similar position in our careers. We were all very, we we're all young, starting out, some success, not too much success, 
So there was a camaraderie and I think a parody really, just speaking mm. of the actors, that lent itself to, to what I feel like is very uh, a distinguishable trait of, of the... An ensemble. More uh, yeah, of, of the piece is that it really is an ensemble. Heading, Captain. Second start of the right. And straight on till morning. What's your life like now? I'm trying to think back when I was 30, uh, I had kids and uh, struggling to, to uh, make a living and uh, keep a roof over their heads and, and food on the table. When different. did you have, a, you had a family by the time you were 30? Well, I think I had my first kid uh, by the time I was 27. Wow. Yeah, I loved the family mm. and I loved surrounding myself with the family. At the same time, when I look back, I realize that's a, a big load. It's an incredible three, response. Three kids finally. And, I so by the time you started the series, by the time you started Star Trek, you had a... I had three kids by the time we finished uh, Star Trek. Wow. And, and was divorced. Wow. What do you spend on those movies? I try to do as much work as I can to, to do justice to the character and to the script. I think every project's different. The, the toolbox you bring to it is the same every time. The tools that you use will inevitably be different given the circumstance and the project and the piece. Are you involved with anybody? Are you, uh, is anybody, is there love in your life? Sure. In my life, I, I'm, my first love really is my work right now. That's where I'm spending my, uh, my time and my energy, but certainly, yeah. But isn't your life then lonely when you're not working? I have great friends and a really wonderful family. What's nice about having grown up in Los Angeles is that this is my home. I've never had uh, mm -hmm. to make it my home. Did you go to school here? I did, yeah. I went to a small private school in the Valley from kindergarten through 12th, and then I went to Berkeley up north in San Francisco. Did you? Yeah. Did you graduate? I did. Where You went to... I went to um, a wonderful university in Montreal. Yeah. Graduated with a business administration, as business they call it down here. Business administration. Yeah, in business, and I got my did you first... Know, did you know that you were going to... Oh, yeah. yeah. I knew when I was six years old. It, it's interesting how it happens, you know? I mean, for some people, it's like you knew from a very early age, and you talk to many actors, and they know, and they talk about their dying passion for it. Ironically enough, having grown up around it, one would expect maybe that I it was um, a foregone conclusion that I would end up in it, but for me, it, it seemed to fit perfectly with certain needs that I had, intellectual needs and... It's so ironic. Uh, most people, myself included, parents say, oh, gee, don't do that. Uh, my father's expression was, you'll be a hanger-on. <laughs> you know, you, yeah. you won't be a success, you'll be, be a beggar, in effect. Mm. That was my father's whole thought about being an actor. But on the contrary, you or your father is saying, great, son. It's in the genes. Well, I mean, I, I too, also grew up in, a, in, a, in an acting environment where it's a blue-collar acting household, which is a completely different, you know, everything is relative. I grew up very comfortable, and I went to a wonderful school, and I was very, in the grand scheme of things, pampered. But I also did see the peaks and the valleys, and I saw the droughts, and I saw the time when money was made and money wasn't. So I think my parents' concern when I first started was more they wanted to make sure that I, I was cognizant, and very aware, and really understood the potential of the, star, the life of the starving artist. Do you recall the moment when you thought, I'm gonna give this a shot? You know, I'd, again, everything just kind of happened like building a, <laughs> the, uh, a house. It was just layer of brick and layer, layer, layer. And by the time I got to my senior year, and, College with not a lot of other interests besides acting, and that was my main um, kind of extracurricular focus that I thought, yeah, I'll give it a go. And um, I never had any sort of arrogance about it, but I just knew, somehow I just knew it would work out. Whether I ended up doing regional theater in Vermont or whether I ended up on a TV show, I just kind of figured it would all work out.
So I've spent the day in bed. Uh, except to rush out of bed for a quick visit and then rush back. And um, and that's been my, my day. So I'm vertical for the first time today, opening night. And yet, it's always been my philosophy that there's nothing you can't do if you put your mind to it. And if you feel sick to your stomach and you still have to perform in front of a Broadway opening, you can do it. It's just a matter of will and focus. So that's what I'm about. I'm about knowing that I can do it no matter how I feel. You have this extraordinary life, which continues to open like <laughs> the most exotic flower, doesn't it? It's unbelievable what's happening to me now. I have shows on the air, things I've conceived of that I'm doing that uh, I do. This is a perfect that... case in point, isn't it? A perfect case in point. You make these things happen. Exactly. You want a jet, you get a jet. You want an actress, you get an actress. And everybody's with you. Like I'm overwhelmed that you and Patrick, for example, and Scott Bakula and Avery Brooks, who talks to nobody. I'm going to talk to you. I'm talking to you. I'm talk to you. I'm overwhelmed. Chief. Yeah. It's overwhelmed great. by, it's by the generosity. You, William. It's about your personality. It's about something that's genuine, that has not been affected by every other kind of success that you've experienced. You know what you're doing? What you're am I doing? laughing in the face of death. I am. You are. And that's Let's exactly death. what Bing. I'm doing. I'm saying to life and therefore to death, I'm still here and I, I'm not extinguished yet. Clever, sharp, smart, thoughtful, wise, and fun. I admire him for his passion about the job he does, about his fearlessness, about the way he seems to be continually recreating himself. Most extraordinary uh, actor in terms of a career that never stops. It's project after project after project. The creation itself is what keeps him going. Because when he's done with the project, what's new? What else can I do? What else can I create in my lifetime? No, 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 I'm not beaming in. You said I could make an entrance with a rocket strapped to my ass. I hope you enjoyed a look at my first 82 years in show business. <laughs> I know I have. You know, y'all got to get some sleep before Mr. Shatner comes in in the morning. So y'all gonna y'all not gonna rest at all. He's gonna be on the full tilt piece. What are you saying? What are you talking about? I'll say it yeah, yeah. Play this back for him. I know what I'm talking about. I've seen it. Well, we're gonna, well, we need to do this. We need to go over there. We need to see, come, come near. Work with me now. Huh? Um, no, no, just, just move over here with me. You know, like this. Yeah. I mean, I'm not trying to imitate him. I'm talking about what I see. <laughs>